Well, earlier this year, on the 18th of January to be exact, um, a man by the name of Howard Kirby, who lives in Michigan in the United States, uh, bought a couch for $70 from a Habitat for Humanity Restore Outlet, which is kind of like uh, Good Sammy's here in Australia. And uh, the couch had uh, an Ottoman footstool type thing that came with it. And so he took the couch home and set it up and sat down to uh, try out his new furniture and he's put his, put his feet up on the Ottoman. And uh, when he did, he noticed that uh, the surface of the Ottoman was just a little unusual and, and a bit uncomfortable, like it was weirdly shaped and, um, and, and a bit out of, out of proportion. And so he, uh, he got up and he unzipped the cover of the Ottoman cushion, opened it up, and to his surprise, he found a bag hidden inside with $43,000 in cash, right? Now, despite the fact that he was kind of entitled to keep the money, he decided it wasn't the right thing to do. And so he contacted the store to see if he could track down the person who donated the couch in the first place. And as it turns out, he managed to do that. And it was a lady who had inherited the couch from her father who had died uh, late last year and she didn't need the couch and so she donated it to charity. So uh, needless to say, she was absolutely delighted and and ecstatic and completely surprised to receive this $43,000 that she never knew that she had, right? Uh, Then a little later on in the year, in uh, in early May, um, another young man by the name of Jose Nunes, right? Jose Nunes, just 19 years of age, Um, was walking to the bank to deposit some money. And uh, on the way, they walked past the ATM next to the bank building and noticed a bag lying next to the ATM on the floor. Um, He picked it up and had a look at it. It was pretty big and pretty heavy, opened it up, and inside was a whole lot of cash. And uh, he noticed on the side of the bag, there was a tag, and the tag said that there was $60,000 in $20 bills inside the bag. So he thought this is uh, probably uh, not mine and I should report it. So he called the police and when he told them what he had found, they came within like two or three minutes. And uh, they took the bag and they opened it up and they uh, investigated the contents and discovered that there was an additional $70,000 inside the bag in $50 notes. There's like $130,000 inside this bag in cold, hard cash, right? Now, uh, Mr. Jose Nunez, it turns out, was a, or is a, uh, a, a criminal justice student at the college, the Central College of New Mexico in Albuquerque. So he was no doubt confronted, right, in a very profound and personal way um, with the temptation <laughs> to forgo his love for justice and fairness and, uh, and to in, indulge. And uh, I wonder, you know, what we would do in a situation like that. I mean, how many of you think that Mr. Kirby and Mr. Nunez are like just the most wonderful human beings ever and should be like celebrated and uh, applauded for their, their amazing feat, right? Uh, how many of you reckon that they are absolutely nuts and, and they, they should have held on to the money <laughs> exactly right uh, as though their lives depended on it? I wonder what we would do in a situation like that. I wonder what you would do. I think we all hope that we would do the right thing. I think we all hope that we would do what they did, but who knows? And uh, the reason I wanna share those stories with you today is because they're wonderful examples of what I wanna throw the spotlight on today. And that is the wisdom of walking in integrity. The wisdom of walking in integrity. Now for several weeks, we've been talking about the wisdom of God and its place and its purpose in our lives. And over in that wonderful Old Testament wisdom writing called the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs 10 and verse nine, it says, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. What the wisdom writer is telling us here is that integrity is a defense. It's a shield, right? Integrity provides security and protection. Um, Integrity will protect your marriage. It'll protect your friendships. It'll protect your business. It'll protect your family. It'll protect your, uh, uh, your reputation. It'll protect your ministry. It'll protect your church. And of course, when integrity is lacking in your life, then all of those things lie vulnerable. So those who walk in integrity walk securely, 
but those who don't are left vulnerable. Um, of course, integrity is also vital to relationships. If you want good, strong, godly, healthy relationships, you have to pursue integrity. And that is simply because integrity is one of the primary building blocks of credibility. And without credibility, there's no trust. And with no trust, there can be no relationship. So if you want good relationships, healthy relationships, godly relationships, you have to commit to integrity. Because if there's no integrity, there's no credibility. If there's no credibility, there's no trust. And if there's no trust, there can be no relationship. So integrity is essential to healthy relationships. Almost all violations of trust are violations of integrity. And so integrity is really important to building good, strong relationships. Now, for all these reasons and more, integrity matters to God like big time. In Proverbs 11 verse 20, it says, The Lord detests people with crooked hearts, but He delights in those with integrity. And really, this should be the primary motivation for pursuing a life of integrity, the fact that it matters to God. Yes, there's life in integrity. There is blessing in integrity. There is security in integrity. There is protection in integrity. But really, the primary reason for pursuing a life of integrity should be that it matters to God. It is important to Him. He values it highly. And so we should value it highly too. Now, the good news is that integrity is not something you either have or don't have. It's not like it's either there or it's not. The truth of the matter is we all have a degree of integrity and we're all capable of growing in integrity. Uh, the pursuit of integrity is really a, a daily, lifelong process that all of us can commit to and all of us can make progress in. Now, when we're talking about integrity, what exactly are we talking about? What precisely do we mean? Because I think you'll agree that Integrity is far more layered and nuanced than any single sentence definition that we can give it. And I wanna to suggest to you today that there are at least five essential ingredients in, in the recipe for integrity. And if you and I are gonna grow in integrity, then we're gonna to have to make a commitment to growing in these five areas at least. And I wanna share them with you today. So if you take your notes, jot them down because it's gonna help you get it into your head and into your heart and into your life. Here they are, the first is this, to show consistency. The first hallmark of integrity is to show consistency. Um, integrity includes this idea of congruency between what I say and what I do, between uh, who I am in private and who I am in public, between what's on the inside and what's on the outside. Uh, a question, what do I have here? A banana. How do you know that I have a banana? It looks like a banana, right? But you don't know that this is a banana because all you're seeing is a banana peel. You don't know that there's a banana on the inside. What you are seeing on the outside is a promise that you hope can be delivered by the substance on the inside. But the only way to find out whether What's on the inside matches what's on the outside is to open it up. So if we peel the banana peel back, we discover a banana, right? I can confirm this is a banana. There you go, Luke, you look hungry. Finish that off. A banana has integrity because what's on the inside matches the expectation of what's on the outside. There's no disparity here. And you know, when Jesus was challenging the religious leaders of his day about their lives and their leadership, one of the many accusations that he brought against them was precisely this, that they were guilty of this disparity, this incongruency. Listen to what he said to them in Matthew 23, verse 27 to 28. He said, woe to you, <laughs> teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Ouch. Painful words. But better to be wounded by the truth than to be comforted by a lie. And Jesus is telling us here, 
what integrity is all about. Integrity means that you are the same no matter where you are or who you are with. It's not like you are one person at church and then another person at the office and then a different person at the footy and yet another person at home. You are the same person, whether you're in private or in public, no matter who you're with. It also means that you treat people with consistency. You don't treat people with partiality or with favoritism. You treat people equally. So to walk in integrity is firstly to show consistency. Uh, The second hallmark of integrity is to speak truthfully, to speak truthfully. Uh, My father-in-law owns a convertible, a cabriolet, a a Peugeot to be more precise. It's a French car and I don't for the life of me know why he bothered to buy a French car. French cars are awful. Uh, Apologies if you are French or a French car owner or a French car manufacturer but your cars are terrible. Listen, you want some wisdom for life? Let me give you some wisdom for life. Get your wine from the French, your food from the Italians, and your cars from the Germans. (laughs) That's wisdom for life right there, okay? So anyway, he bought this Peugeot convertible, and uh, a while back, one of the hydraulic uh, motors in the retractable roof broke. And so he needed to take it in to get it repaired. He took it down to the dealer, and he said, look, this hydraulic uh, motor's gone. I need to have it replaced. How much is it gonna cost? They said, well, this part is incredibly expensive. We don't have it here. We're going to have to fly it in from France and it's going to cost you 75,000 rand. That's about $7,000 for a single part. He said, all right, we have to do it. So uh, go ahead and order the part and let me know when it arrives. Well, one week rolled into two, into three, into four. After four weeks, he hadn't heard anything back from the dealership. So he phoned them up. He said, listen, I've ordered this part. I haven't heard anything from you. Is it arriving? When will it be here? The guy on the other side of the phone said, "Uh, hold on, sir, I'll check. Put him on hold for about three minutes, came back. He said, sir, I'm sorry to say we did order the part. It was shipped from France, but it fell out of the plane on the way here and we have to reorder. (laughs) I kid you not. That is what he said. It fell out of the plane on the way here and we needed to reorder. Well, needless to say, my father-in-law nearly fell off his chair. He was so angry. And when I heard that story, I thought to myself, listen, if you're going to tell a lie, at least try and make it believable, all right? But there is so much of that going on in our world today. It's the old, the check is in the mail. The dog ate my homework. Um, you know, uh, sorry, your email must have gone to my spam folder. No, if somebody sent you an email and you didn't bother to read it and they ask you about it, don't tell them it went to your spam folder. Just say, I'm sorry, I did get your email. My apologies for the delay in getting back to you, but I haven't had a chance to read it or I haven't had a chance to respond to it, right? It is so important that as followers of Jesus that we do business cleanly, that we do life cleanly, that we deal honestly and that we speak truthfully. And again, the reason is simple because if there is any form of lying or deceit or exaggeration or untruth in our lives, then it is gonna undermine trust. And if there's no trust, there can be no meaningful relationship. Proverbs 28 verse six says, better to be poor and honest than to be dishonest and rich. It's true, honesty is the best policy. So integrity includes this commitment to speaking truthfully. Now it almost goes without saying that the truth telling and the truth speaking should be done in love and it should be done with kindness and it should be done with grace. Honesty should never be used as a blunt instrument on anyone. And often the key to honesty being helpful rather than hurtful is just timing and delivery. It's it's not just what you say, but when you say it and how you say it. And that's where wisdom comes in. See, a knowledgeable person may know what to say, but a wise person knows when to say it and how to say it. And so very often, the difference between truth being helpful and hurtful is just simply how you deliver it and when you deliver it. But make no mistake about it, honesty remains an essential part of walking in integrity. The third dimension of integrity is closely related to the one that I've just mentioned, but it's not quite the same thing. And this third aspect of integrity is to allow transparency, to allow transparency. Uh, An important part of walking in integrity is to allow transparency. Now, honesty and transparency are closely related, but they are not the same thing. Transparency is allowing for independent investigation. 
and independent verification. In other words, it's important to tell the truth, but it's equally important to allow others to verify that you are telling the truth by means of their own assessment. To put it another way, transparency is allowing your life to be an open book, or at least living in a way that your life can be an open book should others choose to read it. Um, I love the way Paul the Apostle talks about his own life and ministry in this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 to 2. He said, since God has so generously let us in on what He is doing, we're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we run into occasional hard times. I love that attitude in Paul. Gosh, we need that attitude at times. He goes on to say, we refuse to wear masks and play games. And can I just say, if you're watching from Melbourne, Victoria right now, or anywhere else in the world where wearing a mask is a mandatory part of your COVID mitigation, you cannot use this verse of Scripture to get out of it, all right? That's taking text out of context. You are abusing the Scripture. <laughs> wear your mask. He says, we refuse to wear masks and play games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes. We don't twist God's Word to suit ourselves. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open. The whole truth on display so that those who want to can see and judge for themselves. In other words, Paul is saying, our lives are an open book for you to examine. There's nothing hidden here. And when you walk in integrity, you can allow others to see into your life. You can allow for transparency because you have nothing to hide. Um, when you walk in integrity, you can confidently say to somebody, well, here's my phone. Have a look at my search history. You can, you can say confidently, talk to my wife. Ask her what kind of a man I am at home. Talk to my children and ask them what kind of a father I am. When you walk in integrity, you can, you can say to people, well, talk to my colleagues at work and, and ask them what kind of an employee I am. Here's my credit card transaction. <laughs> Have a look at where I'm spending my money. When you live in integrity, you can allow for transparency. Of course, the converse is true. When you don't walk in integrity, you can't because you have things to hide. And when you do so, you are unwisely leaving yourself and your loved ones vulnerable. You aren't walking securely. So integrity allows for transparency. The fourth dimension of integrity is to act rightly to act rightly. Um, by that I simply mean integrity does the right thing for no other reason than it's the right thing to do. Um, I love this scripture in Ephesians 6, verse one to three. Again, the apostle Paul speaking, he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And all the children said, amen. <laughs> Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. Now, do you notice that, that Paul says here that our primary motivation for honouring our father and mother is not the promise. It's not the blessing. Yes, if you honour your folks, God will honour you. If you honour your mom and dad and the position they hold in your life and over your life, there is life and there is blessing from God. He will honour that. But that is not the primary reason we do it. That's secondary. The primary motivation for honouring your mom and dad, Paul says, is simply because this is right. It's the right thing to do. How many of you know there are just some things in life that are the right thing to do, whether they benefit us or not? Whether there's blessing in it for us or not, they're just the right thing to do. And walking in integrity means you act rightly. You do the right thing because it's the right thing. Now, I'm aware that uh, knowing what the right thing to do uh, is, isn't always easy. It's not always simple. Uh, but I'm not talking about those times in life when we're not sure. I'm talking about the times when we are sure. When beyond a shadow of a doubt, we know what the right thing to do is. It's like C.S. Lewis said. He said, uh, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that worry me. It's the parts I do. <laughs> right? When you know it's right, then integrity acts rightly. It may take wisdom to know what the right thing is, but it takes integrity to do it. And doing the right thing is always the best thing, even if it's a hard thing. Somebody once said, 
Integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. I like that, except it misses a fundamentally important truth, certainly for us as followers of Jesus, and that is simply that someone is always watching. And that is God, right? Jesus said, your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So God is always watching. So that means pay your taxes because it's the right thing to do. Keep your promises. Honour your commitments. Refuse to, refuse to engage in, in, in gossip or in slander. It means if you're uh, pulling out of the parking lot at Bunnings and you accidentally reverse into somebody's car and smash their tail light. You don't drive off as fast as you can and hope there are no security cameras around. You get out and you write a note and you put down your name and you put down your number and you say, I'm so sorry, I reversed into your car and broke your light. Contact me and we'll put a claim through my insurance. And you put it on their windscreen. <laughs> That's the right thing to do, right? If, you, if you're standing in the, in the, in the queue at the, at the shopping mall, getting ready to pay for your groceries and the person in front of you drops $50 onto the floor, you don't put your foot on it and, <laughs> and then walk out of the store like this, you know. No, you pick it up, <laughs> right? And you give it back to them because it's the right thing to do. If you're playing golf with the boss and you score a six <laughs> on that par four, you write down a six, right? Not a five, right? Come on, golfers. You, we all know those people. We've all played with people like that. Bob, what did you score on the last hole? Hold on a second, and then Bob does one of these. Five, <laughs> right? But we all know Bob scored seven. Apologies if your name is Bob, but we all know people like that. Some of you are people like that, all right? If you score a six, write down a six. Why? It's the right thing to do, okay? Integrity does the right thing simply because it's the right thing because God is watching. So integrity acts rightly. And then finally, number five, the fifth hallmark of integrity is to accept responsibility. To accept responsibility. You see, ever, ever since humankind um, rebelled against God in the very beginning, back in the Garden of Eden, uh, human beings have been blaming others. Eve blamed her husband, Adam. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. Adam blamed God. It's a tale as old as time. Every single one of us have like a built-in blame thrower. And every time something goes wrong in our world or in our lives, we fire it up and we try to blame everyone and everything but ourselves. We just have this horrible tendency as human beings to, to avoid responsibility. And yet integrity calls us to accept responsibility. You see, integrity is not about being perfect. It's about being willing to acknowledge that we're not and accepting responsibility when we aren't. The truth of the matter is we all make mistakes. We all make bad choices. We all say things and do things we regret. We all get it wrong. That's a given. We are broken. We are fallen. We are human. And every single one of us make mistakes. The question is, what do you do with those mistakes? What do you do with those bad choices? Do you cover them up? Do you try to hide them away? Do you try to blame somebody else? Or do you take responsibility? Because that is what integrity does. Uh, one of my favourite characters in the Bible is uh, King David of the Old Testament, and many of you would know him well. And of course, David is so often celebrated as a wonderful leader and a warrior and a worshipper. But David made some big mistakes. David made some bad choices. David was the guy who committed adultery with his neighbor's wife and then arranged to have her husband murdered so that he could have her for himself. That's a pretty, pretty big mistake. That's a pretty bad call. And he didn't even acknowledge it or deal with it until he was confronted by Nathan the prophet. And yet at the end of David's life, when all had been said and done, in Psalm 78 verse 72, this was said of David. 
And David shepherded Israel with integrity of heart and skillfulness of hand. Wow, what an amazing thing to be said of a leader and a warrior. He shepherded Israel with integrity of heart and skillfulness of hand. And how is it possible that such a statement could be made about a man who had made so many mistakes and so many bad decisions? A man who might have been a great leader and a great warrior, but who was a poor husband and a poor father. Well, the only reason the Bible says David was a man of integrity and a man with a heart after God's own heart is simply because David was always quick to take responsibility, to repent, to come before God and to appeal to God for His mercy. Psalm 51 verse one to four, David pours out his heart to God in repentance, having been confronted for his sin. And he says these famous words, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. He goes on to say, God, create a clean spirit in me. Renew a right heart in me. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. You see, friends, that is what integrity does. Integrity says, yep, I was selfish. Integrity says, I was irresponsible. I made the mistake and I'm sorry. What can I do to make it right? Walking in integrity isn't being perfect, but it is being willing to acknowledge that we're not and taking responsibility when we aren't. Friends, I'm pretty sure every single one of us want to be people of integrity. We want to walk in integrity. We want to walk in the wisdom and the blessing and the life of integrity. I believe that to the core of my being. And I really do believe that a big part of growing in this area of integrity does not require us to, to, to scale the mountain of, of self-improvement as much as it requires us to immerse ourselves in the river of divine enablement. In other words, to give ourselves to the grace of God, to the mercy of God, and to appeal to God for His grace and mercy to help us grow in our integrity. Uh, Paul, writing in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 12, gives us insight into this truth, this conviction that he held in his heart, that the grace of God was so fundamental to his ability to live with integrity. He says, now this is our claim. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relationship with you with integrity and godly sincerity. We have done so relying not on worldly wisdom, but on God's grace. I love that. Paul says, you know what? The only reason why I can at the end of my life look back on my life and say, hey, I was able to live with integrity was because I leaned heavily on the grace of God. And I love the fact that God hasn't left us to our own devices. God knows our fallenness. He knows our brokenness. He knows our hearts. He knows how prone we are to getting it wrong. And that is precisely why He has made His grace available to each and every one of us. Mercy for when we get it wrong. Grace so that we can get it right. And I wanna encourage you today God, by His Holy Spirit, has been challenging you about integrity in your life. Not to feel bad, not to feel guilty, not to feel overwhelmed, but to look confidently to your loving Heavenly Father. To like David, pour out your heart in recognition of your need of Him. And just simply ask for His grace and His mercy today. Friends, there is life in integrity. There's blessing in integrity. There is security and there is protection in integrity. And wisdom calls us to go after integrity. In our relationships with one another, in our representation of Jesus in this world, and certainly by the grace of God, we can and we will. Amen.